Uh, Mike was here about 12 or 13 years ago for a visit and talked to us about his, um, some of the liver topics that he's expert in. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree from Stony Brook and then uh, left New York where he's a native for the great city of Chicago, University of Chicago where he got his MD degree, then back to New York at Montefiore uh, and the uh, Albert Einstein School of Medicine where he did his internal medicine uh, residency, uh, then also his GI and uh, liver fellowships there. So he came up through the ranks uh, at, at that institution but was then recruited over to Cornell uh, in New York City to begin their liver, uh, help with their liver transplant uh, uh, services. So for the, since 2007 he's been at the Yale uh, New Haven uh, uh, Medical Center uh, in New Haven and has brought that uh, liver transplant center uh, to uh, successful fruition, but also throughout this time he's had a great interest in Wilson's disease and inherited metabolic diseases of the, the liver. So he's going to talk to us about uh, those diseases and transplantation. He's here for the day. He'll be at GI Research Conference at 4.30 for those who can make it. But we're very delighted to have Mike Shulsky here to talk to us today. Michael, Thank welcome. You, So good morning, everyone, and uh, I hope to share with you some of my interest in transplant, but also really thinking about it in terms of what do we do about some inherent metabolic disorders of the liver and how does it fit in. And this has been a, an area of interest of mine in that this is a sort of a subset. For many years in dealing with end-stage liver disease, we were flooded with the world of hepatitis C and alcohol and, and years before gallstone disease and the metabolic corner was this little group of us that used to get sort of uh, put in the corner at our national meetings. And I think now that some of the other diseases have been solved, uh, we're starting to see sort of the rebirth of some of the inborn errors and also some of the acquired metabolic diseases and sort of thinking about how they fit into our practice. Uh, we, you've got a little bit more bandwidth now that we're not pressured by all the uh, dreadful treatments that we would inflict upon our patients in trying to eradicate the viral hepatitis. So it, it's really been a, a pleasure. And I used to, uh, you know, joke about people sitting in the back of the room for some of the talks saying, okay, you know, someday this may become important to you. Wake up. <laughs> and so I think the day has kind of arrived now. Uh, just some... Uh, Disclosures, I will uh, not so much talk on this talk, but later in the day talk about some of the off-label use of some of the medication. All right, so today I hope to accomplish uh, talking a little bit how transplant fits in in the world of inherent metabolic disorders, especially those that have their basis in the liver. Talk about timing a little bit. As they say, timing is everything. And that also where we have to consider at times whether or not just the liver alone is adequate and whether we have to consider other end-stage problems that may occur in other organs so that we may need multi-organ transplant to actually achieve a best outcome for our patient. All right, so this is something that we've come to accept. When I was a medical student, resident, fellow, it wasn't so easy to accept because liver transplant was just being uh, born under Starzl, and uh, in fact, it was almost aborted multiple times. If you look at the history of liver transplant, it had a very difficult birth. Uh, but certainly now the uh, ability to fix failing livers uh, by transplants is extraordinary, and our expectation is no longer that it's going to have an average outcome. It's going to have an exceptional outcome with better than 90% one-year survival and the five-year survival is moving up above 80% as well. And I think we're going to see trends towards improvement in longer-term survival as we start to think more carefully about organ allocation and life extension benefit as opposed to just this sort of one-year survival metric, which a lot of the programs think about now. So this is pretty much a given. You take this ugly organ out and then you replace it with this beautiful liver down on the bottom and it works. But, you know, when you consider what transplant can do in terms of inherited metabolic disorders, you're replacing an organ, uh, certainly for, uh, you know, the, the pathway we generally accept is that, you know, if the metabolic disease leads to liver injury, 
and liver failure or complications such as uh, development of liver cancers, we transplant. But I want you to think also a little differently today, and hopefully I'll add to your thought process, that you have to consider that sometimes the liver itself is not threatened by the abnormality which lay within the liver but yet the liver produces many things which then may be injurious to the host or to other organs within the host that would lead us to want to replace the liver as well. All right, so when we think about you know, liver transplant, we always again think about it as a replacement of the liver, but you're actually also accomplishing potentially gene therapy because you're now taking in some of these diseases which have their basis of the abnormalities within the liver, and I'll show a list of these shortly, you're now putting in an, uh, taking something that has either a non-functional or dysfunctional protein, and then you're basically allowing this to be replaced so that the host phenotype is drastically changed. All right, so some examples of this, and there are a large number of diseases I'm going to sort of hit some of the highlights are diseases like Wilson disease, where the copper transporter is mainly expressed within the liver, and this abnormality of this transporter leads to progressive copper overload, liver injury, and then subsequent deposition outside the liver, where we may see the central nervous system involvement, either neurologic or psychiatric manifestations. Uh, hemochromatosis, which for many years we argued whether it was a gut disease or a liver disease, actually has its basis within the liver, and the HFE gene uh, is, resides within there, and we know that this leads to hepcidin dysregulation. Hepcidin, if you want to think about it in terms of iron, is sort of like the insulin of the iron world. It tells us how to respond to iron loads and regulate, and so there's a dysregulation that occurs when you have the mutations. And indeed, when you replace the liver in patients with this, the whole problem of the iron overload and liver failure and liver uh, cancer, which may develop from the injury, is, is improved. But again, just like Wilson disease, there may be damage outside of the liver so that the iron may deposit in other organs, leading to other end organ failures. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is another disorder, this one of protein folding abnormalities, and the gene, again, is expressed within the liver. When it's failed to uh, circulate normally, we end up with lung disease, and, and uh, emphysema, and then uh, within the liver itself, its retention leads to liver damage. It early it may present as cholestasis in children, or later it may present as a cryptogenic cirrhosis. Tyrosinemia, galactosemia, and uh, are also examples that tend to uh, present earlier on in life, may, you know, with different manifestations, liver failures or uh, secondary problems in some of the uh, glycemic controls. PFIC is another example. This is the uh, 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 transporter which allows phospholipid tr uh, flipase and it, it allows the biliary excretion of, of uh, the bile acids to occur normally. And when you have a defect here, you have a chronic cholestasis which eventually leads to uh, liver failure. Um, interestingly, I'll, I'll talk about later maybe one of the other cases where there's an overlap due to that in some of the changes in copper metabolism. And there's other examples as well, uh, some of the um, polycystic diseases where you have ductal plate abnormalities and porphyrias, of which uh, Herb Bonkowski here is one of our world's experts, uh, where you have, again, the genetic basis within the liver and even cystic fibrosis, which affects more of the biliary tract, can ultimately lead to cholestatic liver disease as well. So again, you know, we have in these cases that have been talking about a defective gene or, or a non-functional or dysfunctional protein that leads to liver disease. Now, uh, there also is the opportunity for gene therapy to occur uh, through liver transplant for diseases where the liver may still appear histologically totally normal. So if you look at, in these cases, you're taking, potentially taking out a normal looking liver, putting back in another normal looking liver, but you're now putting in a gene product that the recipient had that was either aberrant or absent. And this can actually cure a number of diseases. So if we think about it, the liver is home to the defects that occur that lead to the urea cycle defects. 
and so that in ornithine transcarbamylase, those patients may present uh, with seizures or terrible encephalopathy leading to brain damage, yet the liver itself totally normal. Oxaluria uh, disorder in which you may have accumulative oxalate crystals and, and calcium deposition leading to uh, kidney failure and other tissue deposition, and again, liver totally normal. And similarly, in all these other diseases too, Kragelin-Ajar, where it's a transporter for that's uh, involved in uh, glucuronal transferase, and then amyloidosis, where you have the familial type, where you have an abnormality of transthyretin, which is again made by the liver, liver tissue being totally normal, but leads to deposition within other parts of the body, the gut leading to diarrheal syndrome, uh, in the nervous system where you may end up with other abnormalities in these patients and neurodegenerative changes, and then also things like uh, hypercholesterolemia, where the LDL receptor, again, mainly uh, lives within the liver. And so in these patients, when you have normal liver but abnormal receptor, uh, you end up with deposition of the plaques uh, occurring very early in life, and so you may have young children with very advanced cardiovascular disease. So and there's other examples, too, uh, hemophilia being one, uh, again, produced in the endothelial cells in the liver. And so let me just move on to the next part. So very simply to sort of recap, it's important to understand the basis of the disease, uh, not just to say, in the, certainly in the failing liver state, just to replace it because we want to then sort of create the scenario where we can treat the disease, ameliorate the symptoms, prevent other end organ damage at an earlier time. And importantly, if you understand the inherited basis of some of these, you can then do familial screening and try to identify appropriate uh, primary family members who may be affected and then find them early on so you can then, again, get better outcomes for those individuals. So the timing may be critical. Again, in some instances, especially those that lead to uh, damage within the liver cells, DNA oxidative injury, uh, such that occurs with iron and, and, uh, or other uh, promoting uh, turnover in cells like alpha-1 antitrips, and you can have development of liver cancer again. So timing may be important. And again, if for those diseases which have other extra hepatic effects, you have to think about where you are in terms of the status of these other systems. So if you find a patient, for example, who has familial amyloidosis, whose neurologic deficits are so severe, fixing the liver at that point to prevent further uh, deposition of the amyloid protein is probably not going to make them much better in terms of their functionality. So again, you want to try to think about it in a, in a holistic way. Now in the pediatric patients, and I'm always uh, love dealing with my pediatric colleagues because they have an added thing to think about, which is the growth and development of the young patient which is some aspect that we don't always fit into our algorithm in the, in the adult side of things. So they're always worried about timing for uh, doing things that will allow best nutritional status, best developmental growth, and as well as obviously quality of life issues. So if you have injury to these other organs that are re irreversible, uh, and certainly if there are organs that we can replace, we haven't figured out how to replace the neurologic system for those, say, who have familial amyloidosis, but if they have kidney injury uh, that's irreversible, it's not so uh, far out. In fact, we do this not too infrequently. We replace both the liver and the kidney together. And similarly, if you have other organ damage, such as uh, cardiovascular, you sometimes can do heart transplants simultaneous with liver and or with kidney as well. So these are other considerations you have to decide, you know, whether or not that individual with the disease that you're considering liver transplant for is better served by dual organ transplant or not. Uh, one of the reasons not to do it if you don't have to do it is obviously we have a waiting list in each organ and we have a shortage of organs and so certainly we want to be best stewards and give it to those who only are going to need it it doesn't do any good to have you know, somebody with three functioning kidneys after a transplant, uh, which happens sometimes, and uh, it's, you know, certainly those on the kidney waiting list are not very happy about that. So we have to be good stewards. So let me jump into some cases. I think this will kind of highlight some of the points we've been uh, talking about. 
So this was a 55-year-old gentleman that had insulin-dependent diabetes developing later in life and was referred for uh, transplant uh, because he had worsening uh, liver function. And his symptoms also included dyspnea of exertion and, and edema, and he had a very severely affected uh, cardiac ejection fraction. Now, diagnostically, on his uh, paddle, he had obviously low albumin, the INR was up a little bit, but what stood out is he had a ferritin of 1900. And so then they tested for the HFE defect. And in this individual was a homozygous for uh, C282Y mutation of the HFE gene. Uh, but you should know that the homozygotes are most commonly are the patients that will be affected in hemochromatosis leading to the iron deposition. Uh, but sometimes you can have compound heterozygosity as well with the less severe defect, the H63D, if the patient has uh, appropriate background and other uh, phenotypic, well, I should say other extragenic reasons for the iron deposition. Iron, iron deposition is a complicated disease because the penetrance isn't uh, 100% and there's abnormalities in these individuals that lead them for propensity to develop iron overload. So in this individual, if you were to look at that liver, this is kind of what it would look like. It would look kind of rusty, lumpy, bumpy for that. And then this is a different cell uh, that was biopsied in him. I won't keep you guessing too long. This is actually cardiac myocyte. So he had a, a right heart cath and a, and a biopsy performed. And you can see in the blue on the right, this is histochemical iron deposition within the uh, heart. And so this patient was developing severe changes of, of cardiomyopathy that was resulting from his iron overload. So he underwent further uh, evaluation, focusing on the heart, and then we started him on uh, desferoxamy. And the purpose of removing the iron from that, we know that uh, transplant outcomes for hemochromatosis have changed over the ages. If we can actually get good removal of iron, then they don't end up dying from cardiac dysrhythmias uh, or higher risk of infection, which also can occur. And then over time, you can then sometimes rescue the heart function. If you don't, you can actually consider doing dual organ transplant, liver and heart, although it's been years since I've seen one uh, done for this disease, and I think that's because everybody out here is doing a better job of finding these patients earlier, which is great. Let me go on to another patient now. This is a 19-year-old college freshman who suddenly developed jaundice and fatigue of, of ability and had severe anemia, and so started off in a hematologist's office uh, where they were evaluating hemolytic anemia. But, you know, it took about a week, and finally they did an INR and saw that the INR was two, and they said, uh-oh, and let me get this patient over uh, for further evaluation. Maybe it actually needs a liver specialist. And so further testing showed that her alkal alkaline phosphatase was very low and the bilirubin was rising. And so then she had progressive signs of liver failure as well. And so this individual, you know, had they been real sharp the first time she presented the office, they could have uh, immediately known that this uh, young lady had Wilson disease with acute liver failure. And you don't need the fancy gene tests. You don't need wait for all the copper studies to come back. You can actually look at some very simple measures. Uh, this is some data that came from the acute liver failure study group and some work of some patients that I was working with at Mount Sinai as the control group in the chronic uh, phase. And Jessica Corman, who was a student at the time working with me, we reviewed, you know, what were some of these measures in patients who presented with liver failure uh, with Wilson disease and those who had a control group who didn't have Wilson disease. And what we found was that we used some of the uh, reported ratios, the outfast to total bilirubin that Art McCullough actually uh, beautifully had initially described, and the Pittsburgh group had looked at the AST to ALT ratio as well. And what we did is we looked for the sensitivity and specificity in our population for these patients. And it turns out this is one of the rare diseases where the alkaline phosphatase keeps going down as the patient gets sicker and the bilirubin keeps going up because of the liver failure, failure to clear it. At the same time, they have a hemolytic anemia, which is driving it more rapidly. And if you end up taking those two ratios out across the total bilirubin of, and you look at it and it's less than four and the AST to ALT is greater than 2.2, you can actually have near 100% sensitivity and specificity 
And you can look very smart in the emergency room and say, send this patient to a transplant center. She has acute uh, liver failure due to Wilson disease. And indeed, this patient met that characteristic. Now, one interesting thing to note um, is if you look at the ceruloplasmin, which everybody thinks is a phenotypic marker for this disease, we'll talk more about that later today, um, you'll notice sensitivity for that alone is terrible in this particular uh, setting. So it's very different than in the chronic patients where sensitivity is higher and specificity is much greater. All right, so this is the underlying defect in, in uh, Wilson disease is there's problems and mutations of this particular copper transporter which lives within the liver cells and keeps copper from uh, accumulating. And so what happens in this individual, as, as I showed you, is they have uh, this defect of the transporter. They lead to chronic copper accumulation. And the liver itself uh, undergoes inflammatory change. And in these individuals, differing from those who present in the more chronic way, something happens where their antioxidant potential just drops to the floor, whether it's a prior injury from uh, a viral illness or medication. We don't often find the exact answer being the same in all patients, but there's this sudden presentation. Now, fortunately, it's only 5% of these patients with Wilson disease that do this, and it's a very accelerated course, very dramatic, and transplant cures that. So we do have indications for transplant for Wilson's in this setting in particular, and certainly for those who have end-stage liver disease that may present too late even without that. Uh, and in each of these cases, you actually can think of the phenotype being restored to normal. Because once you put in a normal liver with a normal ATP7B, copper goes out into bile, ceruloplasmin normalizes. Copper that's deposited in other tissues slowly exits the body. And you can tell that because if they had Kaiser Fleischer rings, which 50% of these patients do the, and from the liver presentations, they actually go away. And so you know that that's happening itself without having to, you know, do brain biopsies. Nobody likes to do that. So this particular patient uh, kept getting worse. Ultimately, we did some measures to try to keep that extra copper that's pouring out of the damaged liver from damaging the rest of the organs, sustained her until she got a transplant. Now, interestingly, uh, she received a transplant from her father, who's obviously a heter obligate heterozygote, for the disease, but you know we know that heterozygotes still have good function uh, in terms of copper uh, excretion. So she did very well and continues to do well to today. All right, so this is a dramatic uh, in case of an individual 13 years old, had cholesterol well above 300 at that age, and, uh, and that was on statin therapy. And so at now, because of problems, he had to go undergo continued intermittent apheresis. So the hallmarks of these individuals presenting early often are xanthelasma. And if you look, you can actually see more uh, advanced disease uh, w within the cardiovascular system, even at this young age of 13. So there have been, uh, since I first saw that particular case, there have been much more advances in terms of how we understand some of the defects from the genetic basis, and now we can either make the diagnosis by finding the um, gene abnormalities for the LDL receptor or other parts of the pathway uh, for metabolism of, of cholesterol, or we can actually define it by patients who have uh, LDL fractions that are greater than 500 or when they're treated, 300 milligrams in the concert with presence of uh, xanthoma before the age of 10. Uh, and again, they can also find changes in the parents as well, which may allow you to uh, identify that. All right, so there are other um, ways of thinking about it. It's a very complicated disease, this hypercholesterolemia, and some of my colleagues in the lipid field have enjoyed a lot of advances once they've sort of figured out the molecular basis, and some of these things have to do uh, with loss of function mutations that lead to, uh, you know, you have one abnormality, then it becomes dominant by affecting the other allele, and then there's only one that was a particular gain of function abnormality. But once you have an individual like this, uh, they can be controlled to some degree, uh, but, you know, again, the biggest problem, and you can see Right at the beginning of the LAD here, you can see a narrowing that occurs. Uh, 
And this is, an, again, in a 13-year-old, so that's very scary. All right, so what happens if you transplant the liver? You're giving them normal pathways, whichever one of those mutations the individuals have. You see regression of the xanthoma. Coronary disease can reverse, and then ultimately you don't have progression. Um, there was one interesting case of a patient that was transplanted for this disorder who developed um, a rejection and some cholestatic change, which probably altered the lipid profile, and that individual ended up with progressive valvular disease, which is usually not the case. Usually the valvular disease arrests where it is. If it was severe, it needs to have it uh, repaired. So again, this is an example on the left side, the xanthoma, and on the right, the disappearance after transplant. And here, I apologize for the large number of things on the slide, but I want you just to focus. This is a timeline from here going down, and this is the cholesterol. And you can see in this individual, even though it was treated with uh, statin agents, you don't see a whole lot of change in the cholesterol, some minor uh, reduction. You see a larger reduction when they had apheresis, uh, but unfortunately, again, this is a you know, requires a catheter for long-term placement, and this one developed uh, problems with thrombosis, so they had to stop that, and you can see the cholesterol jumped right back up, and here's where the patient had a liver transplant. Now you see the profile that is more dependent on the donor liver, no longer dependent on the uh, recipient itself. Now, there is something called the domino transplant. Can I guess how many people have ever heard of that? All right, good, we have a few. So what, in that case, what you do is you take a disease, um, a liver from a patient with a disease, but it's not a diseased liver. These are the diseases I've been talking to you about, like uh, familial amyloidosis, or in this case, uh, the hypercholesterolemia, where the liver tissue is histologically totally normal. And you take that liver out of the recipient who's getting transplanted for problems with that disorder, and you put it into another patient. And the reason is if you have a disease, say, like amyloidosis, it may take a number of years for that individual to develop the complications from the amyloidosis. And yet if you're transplanting, say, a 65-year-old with multiple liver cancers, you know, that may be a way to get them to move to the front of the line by using a liver like this. So this was a very interesting patient that was reported by the group in Michigan from somebody who a liver was taken from a patient with familial hypercholesterolemia and they gave it to another recipient. And what they saw was there was a rapid progression of atherosclerosis uh, when they put it into another individual. And the individual in this case had primary sclerosing cholangitis or cholestatic disease, but didn't have much in the way of abnormalities in the lipid profile. So let me show you on the axis here is the cholesterol on, up here. And this is the timeline of the individual, and this is before transplant. You can see their cholesterol was lower. And suddenly you give them a liver from somebody with hypercholesterolemia, and their profile goes way up. Now, unfortunately, in this case, even when they gave statin therapy and some of the other antibody therapies, you know, they had a you know, they had some reduction, but you know, this person would still be at risk with a cholesterol running around of three hundred and high. Uh, triglycerides as well. Uh, so you do have to take that into account. Again, this is always the risk benefit of considering the timing of transplant. So an individual who may never have been able to get transplanted but who is doomed to die of their underlying disease may benefit from something like this, even taking on that extra risk. But you do, in this case, give life extension. And so it's always you have to think of the consequence for that. Even in um, the transthyretin livers, people have reported, and actually if you go back even 20 years ago, Nigel Heaton and the group at King's reported, uh, wrote a letter saying, you know, we've seen some uh, neurologic progression in patients who receive those other livers. But again, depends who you put it into, what their life expectancy is in any way. I would never put a liver from a patient like this into somebody who is, say, 20 years old. Uh, because you're going to end up with the consequences of this uh, down the line. All right, so another patient here that presents with hypoglycemia uh, but happened to have hepatomegaly. In this case, they, the investigation revealed that there was a storage disease, glycogen storage type 1, uh, and that was confirmed by both enzymatic activity as well as genetic testing. Uh, 
Uh, and actually, that's been a very interesting evolution because uh, years ago, a lot of the uh, liver biopsies had to be obtained to do a lot of the enzyme testing. Now, a lot of the genetics are there uh, to complement this or, in fact, replace it in some instances. Uh, so in this case, the individual happened to develop uh, progressive renal insufficiency and also had multiple hepatic adenoma. In this particular disease, some of these have uh, risks of, of uh, uh, becoming uh, liver cancers themselves. And so indeed, they had one that was very suspicious, had an ablation. Uh, and this individual was listed for liver and kidney transplant. And this would be a picture of uh, from the liver in an individual like this, you can see these multiple adenomas, and some of them become so numerous, and it's really very difficult to undergo surveillance and, and have your radiologist tell you with accuracy whether or not a cancer has really developed, and so it's really challenging. And so people with the underlying genetic disorder for this are better off getting transplanted, and indeed this individual had a liver and a kidney transplant and did very well afterwards, no recurrence. All right, so now this is shifting a little bit back to pediatrics. This is a young patient that actually developed recurrent uh, kidney stones and had a decreasing uh, glomerular filtration rate, impending renal failure, and had oxalate crystals in the urine and nephrocalcinosis on imaging. And nephrocalcinosis is defined as deposits of the calcium salts within the renal tubules, tubule epithelium, or interstitium. And you can actually make that diagnosis on an ultrasound uh, for these individuals. You're, uh, uh, imaging specialists can help you. And the underlying disorder in this is most commonly uh, and uh, the primary hyperoxaluria type 1, and it can present even as early as the first year of life, and many may present later on. Uh, and there's a couple of defects in the pathway I'll show you in a moment. Interestingly, this actually occurs within the peroxisome as part of the metabolic pathway. Um, and then there's uh, two other types of, of uh, hyperoxaluria. But type 1 is probably the most common type that we know responds well to transplantation. Uh, this is the metabolic pathway, and you can see the defect occurs within the peroxisome. And with its failure, you end up with glyoc uh, glycolate, glyoxylate uh, accumulation. So you can look in the urine and find different uh, products of these individuals because it doesn't go down the normal pathway to produce the glycine. And so there's a, a nice algorithm that was developed to look at some of these individuals, and they can either early on have very uh, normal renal function or they may present very early with chronic kidney disease. Either way, the urine screening is usually the next test, and then you do have to, in individuals that don't have uh, uh, you, you know, other history, sometimes you have to make sure you look and don't exclude the other causes for hyperoxaluria, uh, which would be malabsorptive. You can see this in a lot of the inflammatory bowel disease with malabsorption. And then if the answer is that you don't have secondary reasons to have the oxaluria, then you can do the genetic testing. But again, not all gene testing is perfect, so if you do, do come up negative on that, you can then go down the pathway of looking for the activity within biopsy to prove that you have the disorder. Uh, the outcome here uh, is that the disease was diagnosed in this young individual. Uh, B6 is tried in some of them, and, and about 30% of the PH1 can be responsive to B6. That was something that I, I learned recently. I was surprised, but two-thirds aren't, and they underwent a successful liver and kidney transplant. Now, an interesting thing in uh, reviewing the cases on this, very years ago when they did these transplants and they put in a liver and a kidney, suddenly they would have kidney failure again. And what they weren't considering was that there was a lot of calcium deposition um, and calcium oxalate deposition in other parts of the body. And what was happening after the transplant, it was sort of a sudden pouring out of that into the circulation and then out the kidney, and you were resulting in, in damage to the kidney. So. What they learned was to do a lot of hemofiltration after the procedure, or the other option was to do stagger the operations. Now, there is an immunologic advantage of getting a liver and a kidney from the same host uh, donor because the, they um, have obviously the same uh, immunologic match, uh, but there is also the opportunity, especially in pediatric patients, to get a uh, partial uh, living donor transplant and then secondarily get a kidney transplant, and so if you replace the 
uh, liver first, you'll then allow the clearance and normal metabolic pathway to occur, and then subsequently you can do the uh, kidney transplant and you don't have that deposition. So either way tends to work and give you better outcomes. So what about the future? And I do suggest everybody, this is my uh, family, and we went on a nice journey to Alaska, and I hope you see this before it melts away. Uh, and don't believe that there's no such thing as climate change. These glaciers are disappearing. So please get there before they, they uh, go away. It's really a magnificent sight. So where's the future going to take us? Actually, I hope less transplants. If we find a way to replace the, these genes and the abnormalities uh, for these disorders, uh, and we can then hopefully save the livers for patients who have the failing livers. Obviously, those who have the disorders where the liver is severely affected already, they're probably doomed towards transplant, but those other disorders, and a great example is the transthyretin abnormality, where people are now doing uh, directed therapy with uh, microRNA, which is suppressive, using a receptor-mediated endocytosis pathway that's very specific for liver. I know Dr. Bonkowski has been involved with the ones for the porphyrias as well, and that's really uh, remarkable. I think they just published the phase three uh, trial in the New England Journal. It's really a fantastic thing, and you should uh, all read that. But I hope that those kind of therapies are going to obviate the need for, for transplant for those where we can find them in time and, and be successful. Um, but uh, however, you know, for those who've already undergone the pathway where we have the risk for uh, paracellular carcinoma, cholangiac carcinoma, probably transplant is going to be, be needed. Now, just a little bit of editorial comment for a minute and take us back to 1999. Um, you know, for those of us who were around and practicing then, we always said, you know, gene therapy was around the corner, and that was 20 years ago. Uh, what happened? And what happened was a little bit of a uh, thing which kind of irks me still. And this was taken from the New York Times, and they talked about this uh, young patient who had OTC deficiency who, um, you know, he was having obviously the inability to maintain the low protein diets and taking multiple medicines and his quality of life was affected. But, you know, he was alive and he was doing okay until he had gene therapy with an adenovirus and then they basically had a terrible immune reaction and died. And this led to um, a moratorium on gene uh, therapy for many years and led to us to reconsider our consent process for disease. What you don't see here, and never mentioned in any papers anywhere, is the option that they could have transplanted this kid and probably had a perfect outcome. Never mentioned anywhere. But you think about it, the defect lay in the liver, and they would have been doing their own kind of gene therapy by doing it. So 20 years have gone by. We're now at the era of gene, the cusp of gene therapy, um, and we've overcome some of the problems from that. But historically, nobody really kind of talks about this. So in conclusion, I think a lot of our understanding of these diseases has allowed us to identify these individuals, think about timing and selection and management for transplant in a much more sophisticated way than we could have many years ago. And we can now get very good long-term outcomes in these individuals because those who have the affected livers you know, suffer the slings and arrows of total hypertensive complications, risk of, of uh, malignancy, and certainly that's all fixed by transplant. But transplant is certainly by no means easy, and the patients do have to live with immunosuppression and complications, but it certainly dramatically changes the quality of life and, and the outcomes for some of these individuals. And certainly the future is going to bring new therapies, earlier recognition, and hopefully save livers for those who really will need them. So I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at, at Yale and certainly our patients who continue to teach us, and I uh, thank you all for your attention. But I, I wondered, you know, as, as an internist, I mean, how do how do we all, how do uh, the internists kind of get suspicious of these, these diseases? How do they get to you? What impresses you, like, you know, by the internal medicine folks who find these patients and bring them to your attention? What do you suggest 
we all do. So the importance, and, and there's certainly different levels of responsibility that we accept in seeing patients with undiagnosed disorders. And certainly the, those that have um, the liver abnormalities, I always say that's the easier path because you're going to take them and hopefully refer them appropriately to your GI liver colleagues who then need to go to the next level in terms of making sure the diagnostics have reached their conclusion. Uh, there is a very uh, uh, young developing field of, uh, for those patients who have these undiagnosed disorders of doing this sort of whole genome sequencing and looking back, and there's some rare pickups as well. Uh, but I think, you know, if we do our, uh, our careful evaluation and we partner properly, you know, we'll get the right patients to us. What, what usually happens, and, you know, and I, and I hope people don't get frustrated by it, but you have this sea of fatty liver out there of people who drink a little bit or people who are obese, and they come in and they have mild liver abnormalities. And the, and the thing is you have to remember that, you know, disorders of fatty liver or fatty liver with inflammation are still ultimately diagnosis of exclusion, that you have to consider these other less common options before you put that single label on them. And so, we, you know, just being that, you know, good partner, not accepting that, you know, if we tell them to lose 20 pounds and the, and the liver enzymes don't normalize, you know, you know, get back and, and try to get an answer uh, to that. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, I'm sure somebody's working with CRISPR uh, on some of these. Uh, can you just speak to that? Well, I, I believe the only CRISPR uh, patients are in China so far, I hope. <laughs> uh, so gene repair is just another alternative method for achieving correction of, of the disorders. The, Again, it will depend upon the disorder and the number of mutations as to the practicality of this. So let's take Wilson disease, for example. There are now over 500 disease-specific mutations, and the vast majority of our patients are what we call compound heterozygotes, one different mutation on each allele. So we would have to, in theory, target you know, a whole lot of different mutations, and then the question is, is it going to be viable you know, to do so? Uh, I think eventually the answer will be yes when the technology becomes rapid and quick, the gene repair will come into the fray. Uh, if you have a population like my colleague does in, in Austria where, um, you know, the majority of his patients have the dominant mutation, one particular one, maybe it might be more practical. But, you know, the problem again comes in again on the disease, the number of mutations, and then, you know, um, you know, how successful can you in, be in delivering that back? So, you know, you might have to propose taking the liver cells out, working on them ex vivo, and then putting them back in, which is a whole different technology, uh, but one that's not impossible. And then you have to consider, you know, what will be the effect of not correcting it in all the cells? So some diseases, like transport diseases, like Wilson disease, we've actually done that um, testing in, in animal models where you can put transplanted cells into uh, either a mouse or a rat model. And if they're normal and the transporters are normal, those cells will integrate into the hepatic cords and actually excrete enough copper to be protective of the cells around them. But not all diseases that, you know, the case, let's say you have a protein accumulation disease like alpha-1. You know, you'd have to knock down the product as opposed to, you know, uh, repair it only because then you still have damaged cells and damaged things, uh, you know, ongoing. And so it's going to be a while, but I think there's definitely potential in gene repair. Question. Uh, Enjoyed your talk. Thank you. A uh, question has to do with the hereditary form of transthyretin amyloidosis. Um, there are multiple gene abnormalities. Here in the South, we have valine isoleucine predominantly, um, or the vasal uh, V30M. Uh, um, question is the role of liver transplantation in varying forms, particularly the valine isoleucine type of hereditary TTR amyloid, and their outcomes with or without cardiac involvement. So this is, you know, unfortunately it's, it's an area where we don't have huge literature, but there is some uh, 
it all depends on the stage at which you find the individual, and there's sort of a lead time bias. If you get these individuals too late and their cardiac functions, you know, affected severely, you know, outcome can be not so good. Um, same thing with the neurologic incapacitation that occurs. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I think any of these that have, have the basis in the liver doesn't matter which one can potentially benefit, but the question becomes, what about the other tissues? And, and is there, uh, there was some report, I believe, of choroid production of some of these abnormal proteins as well. So there may be CNS progression, even if you transplant, but certainly the larger tissues like the gut, uh, something, you know, that comes from the circulation for the heart may be, may benefit. But the, the, those are great questions, and it all comes down to uh, tissue specificity for the production of the abnormal protein. Uh, you know, the liver is just dominant in terms of what it makes per, you know, per day in terms of what it outputs, but there are small quantities elsewhere, and, and I think that's the fine-tuning of these things that we need to learn more about. Great. It's a great question. Thank you for that. So for a lot of these monogenic disorders, um, how many intact or normally functioning hepatocytes or liver cells do you think you need in order to correct the disease manifestation? So in other words, do we actually need to transplant an entire liver or um, should we focus our efforts on injecting sort of cell extracts or? So it's a question we ponder frequently as we're now approaching the era of gene therapy. And we know that transduction, uh, even by the more efficient vectors that are present now, is never 100%. So the question becomes, again, what is the correction that you need for that disease? So again, let me jump back to Wilson disease because we actually kind of thought about that when we were doing the cell transplant model. And it turned out we needed about a 30% cell correction to then restore that sort of normal homeostasis. But here's the rub. You know, the question is, when can you get that 30% in? If you've already developed the advancing disease within the liver, that 30% doesn't integrate the same way. Um, the other question that comes up is, what happens if you transduce and you end up with uh, even 10%, but those 10% of cells have multiple copies? compared to the normal. And so are you creating super cells in terms of pumping efficiency? So maybe you don't need 30% if you can transduce with a very high efficiency multiple copies. So these are unanswered questions uh, that are, we're right on the cusp of trying to prove. But, you know, you have to think of the pathophysiology of each disease and say, you know, you know which diseases can you have that sync effect of, of replacing uh, versus which of those you have uh, defective protein or missing that causes damage to a cell that you can't necessarily replace. Now, if you were able to identify at a very young age the disorder, you can replace in some and then allow the normal processes to eliminate by cell turnover uh, some of the damaged cells, and then you'll have a repopulation effect with the healthy cells. But, you know, that still comes with a risk because a number of these disorders, you do have DNA oxidative injury and risk of carcinogenesis. And so uh, even a good example is like PFIC. There are, are cases that are rare reports or that I know from colleagues where you have uh, cholangiocarcinoma develop. So are you, you know, when you find the rare cases into adulthood, you know, are we better sitting around on these and, and treating them with ERSO buying time, or are we better transplanting them earlier? No, nobody knows the answer to that. You, um, you touched on one thing that's a clinical question I actually had about hemochromatosis. And do you have a standardized protocol to approach elevated ferritins when you talk about transplant and concern? I mean, when I trained, we didn't routinely do heart biopsies. I mean, I know it's a unique case that you're presenting, but do you have a protocol at blank level? We do cardiac MRI or something else to exclude potential patients who you think be, or do you ultimately, if you're going to make that call for a transplant, do you actually do a, a cardiac biopsy? So a number of years ago, um, Chris Calvi organized this. I was part of the consortium of, of group that looked at iron overload in patients that had transplants. So what we did was we took all the explant livers and worked backwards. Uh, 
And we only found HFV abnormalities in a percent of those patients. I figure it may have only been 30 or 40 percent. And the rest were actually non-HFV iron accumulation. A lot of those were alcoholic patients or alcohol and hep C uh, individuals. And in those uh, patients, we, we found obviously high ferritins. And so that's sort of starting backwards the other way, looking at it. Uh, and there was cardiac uh, involvement with a higher number of, of arrhythmias and things occurring. That said, what we learned is we could not really understand exactly what the threshold was for the uh, iron deposition in the extrahepatic tissues. Uh, we know that liver damage, and based on Paul Adams' work, and uh, Chris Cowley has confirmed this as well, and uh, Paul did this as part of the AIR study, uh, which was a large uh, hemochromatosis study around North America that they identified, you know, obviously a lot of phenotypic variation in the iron overload, but they never saw the advanced liver disease in anybody without a ferritin over 1,000. So when we start seeing these other, you know, lower ferritins under 1,000, the likelihood of, of that being the cause of the liver disease was lower, but it doesn't tell us what the threshold is for depositing in the heart or other organs. And we just recently talked about a case at our recipient review that blew my mind because it had a ferritin of 450, had uh, a change ejection fraction, so we, and, and there was some iron deposition on the MR of the liver, so we said, all right, let's, you know, put the beam higher up and let's go look at the heart. And the patient actually has iron deposition and we're doing, um, treat, treating with desferoxamine right now. And so that, you know, that was an exception and I've not usually seen it in patients with that low of ferritin. I know the group out at UCSF um, years ago, I don't know if they ever completed the work, but they were trying to uh, look uh, systematically, doing a lot of testing, <laughs> probably more testing than anybody would want to do on these patients, and I don't know if they ever came up with an exact answer. But I do know when the, certainly when the, you know, is it relevant if you don't have an ejection fraction change and the answer is maybe not, because when you do take the liver out, you're now, you know, instantly providing, providing a new sink for ferritin, I mean, for the iron that's in transit, and, and the iron really drops dramatically because you're taking out that huge store that's in, in the uh, liver. And so those patients correct pretty quickly. But, um, you know, certainly if we've identified it uh, as a change in the ejection fraction, we do get cardiac MRs on those patients, and if we see iron deposition, they, those are people that are uh, treated with chelation, and we follow their functional status, you know, very closely, you know, and often we'll do right and left heart casts in them, making sure that they, they don't have a lot of problems on the right side, which uh, gives our anesthesiologists uh, headaches at the time of transplant. Okay, are there any final questions? I thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms, please. Yeah, that was a good one. The, actually, a very sophisticated one from the gentleman on the heart. Thank you, sir. Good question. Yeah.